Well, we want to continue today with our theme of what's so amazing about grace. And uh, the answer today is God's promise. A promise is going to be mentioned about eight times in this section that we're looking at. And uh, promises are so important. Um, you know, when we were kids and we promised something, we'd say, I cross my heart, right? And hope to die. <laughs> you know, we had this little ritual we went through when we made a, pro a promise. In, in the Bible times, uh, you could go through a ritual too, and it was called covenant. Covenant. And we don't use the word covenant too very often. Uh, we even, the word testament, we don't use very often. Uh, we use it in the, the term last will and testament. Testament. Uh, we could also say last will and covenant because the idea is the same. It is a binding contract. Okay? And we're going to find today that God made a binding contract of his promise and of his love. Okay? And that binding contract uh, is what's so amazing about God's grace. Uh, if grace is so wonderful, okay, and uh, you live, you're saved by grace and the faith of the Lord alone, and that's what saves you, the question then uh, Paul anticipates in the mind of his Jewish readers is this. If that is so, why did he give the Ten Commandments? Why did he give the law? I mean, if it... If it's all about grace, then why in the world do we have the law? Why, do, why were all the rules? Why were there the Ten Commandments? Or if you, read, if you were like Maimonides and you looked up in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, every command or prohibition, there's 613 of them. Why did God give all those if it's all by grace? Good question. And that's exactly the question that Paul wants to answer this morning. All right? First of all, I want to suggest this, that grace is superior to the law, and that's exactly what this passage is about that we're going to look at. But why is it so superior to the law? First of all, for the covenant's sake. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. He said, okay, somebody makes out their will and, and testament, their, their covenant. Uh, so that uh, they, they fill that out, it's been sealed, it's documented, and then the person dies. And then it's given to an arbitrator to uh, actually disperse the inheritance. You cannot go and change it. You can't say, oh, well, no, you know what he did? He said this to me. It's not in the will and testament. Got it? And so what he's saying here is, listen, it says in this one, he says, no one can set aside or add to the covenant that God made. And he's speaking of a sp particular covenant, the covenant of promise that he made to Abraham. And, and so he goes on, he says, that's what's going on in this case. If you can't do it in every ordinary day existence, you can't go changing covenants. You can't change this one e either. For the promise, and he's talking about the promised covenant that God entered into with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 down through 7, where he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those who bless you. Uh, and through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I'm going to give you this land. And he says there, he says, listen, the promises were spoken to Abraham. God made them to Abraham. And then he says, and to his seed. He says, now, the word seed, the word seed, can, it's kind of like the word reindeer. You don't say reindeers. <laughs> you don't put an S on the air. It's either singular or plural. It stands for both. Seed is the same way. To Abraham and to his seed. It can be plural or singular. And so most people would have taken it here to be uh, plural because Abraham had a lot of children, the whole Hebrew nation. But he says, the scripture does not say seeds puts an S on it. What he's trying to say here is, the Holy Spirit has given me revelation and inspiration so that I know he's not referring to plurality of seeds. He is speaking directly to one. He says, to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. This is so powerful. Back when God appeared to Abraham and he made the promises to Abraham, he made them to Abraham and also to Jesus. God made the promise to Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Didn't make him just to Abraham and all of his descendants, but he made him to Abraham and to that one seed, Jesus Christ. 
He moves on and says, this is what I mean to say. The law, okay, the law which was given by Moses, came 1400, at 1440 B.C. We know it was around that time that Moses was on Mount Sinai, received the law from God. And he says, listen, that law that he received, the Ten Commandments, 613 commands, all of that, that came 430 years later. So something took place 430 years before the promise. He says, that, that law that came later, it does not set aside the covenant previously established by God. But wait a minute. Abraham lived in 2100 B.C. That's more than 430 years. What happened later that was 430 years? Well, Abraham did have a son. His son was Isaac. And God ratified the covenant with Isaac. And then Isaac had a son, Jacob. And God ratified the same promised covenant so that it went from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob was the last one it was ratified with in 1870 B.C., 430 years before. He said, okay, this, this promise, this age of promise, th this age that God made this promise to Abraham that he was going to bless him and his family, his seed, and he's going to give him a land, and through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He said that took place 430 years before. So it's superior to the law because it came first. The promise came first. The point is, the promise came before the law, and the law cannot alter it. It would be like somebody trying to alter a last will and testament for somebody who died. You can't do that. You can't do that. This covenant was ratified. It had already been put into effect. God made a promise. And the law which came later, it cannot negate the promise. That's so important. Now, he says, for if the inheritance depended upon the law, okay, so... If the promise depended on the law, then it no longer de depends, that then it no longer depends on the promise. Listen, if you can get the inheritance of grace and salvation and every forgiveness of sin and pardon, if you can get all that through the law, then it's no longer dependent upon the promise. They don't equal the same. They're not the same. And so he goes on and he says, but God in his grace gave to Abraham, gave it to Abraham through the promise. The promise, and that's what's a key in this passage, the promised inheritance came not by the law. It came before the law, and it came by the grace of God, God's grace. Never does it say Abraham did anything to receive this promise. God just graced him, blessed him, gave it to him. And you can't do anything to inherit the inheritance of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can only accept it like Abraham accepted it. That's his whole point. That's his whole point. That's why grace is superior to the law, for the covenant's sake, the covenant promise that God made with Abraham. Now, that's not the only reason. There's another reason that he's going to give. It's for the addition's sake, the addition. What then was the purpose of the law? Wait a minute. If you're saying that Abraham was promised this eternal blessing of everlasting life and all of that that goes with that. He was promised that, and he didn't have to do a thing to get it. Then why, was the law, why is there a law? What's the purpose of the law? And he goes on to say, it was added. It was added. Not to fix the promise. It was added to expose sin. It was added because of transgressions. Transgression, when you transgress, you're breaking a law. You're breaking a law. That's what it means, transgress, break a law. You know, you, you break them all the time. Did you ever open the refrigerator and reach for something, not quite get your grip on it, and all of a sudden you, it, it slips out of your hand? It doesn't just float in space. Did you ever notice that? No. So if you have a dozen eggs, you pull them out of the refrigerator, and you, you kind of slip. They don't just float there in the air and tell you, oh, wait a second, I get those again. And they go crashing down, and you got... You got eggs everywhere. Why? You broke the law of gravity. You broke it. You see? And, and, and so that's the whole thing. It's always breaking a law. He says, well, the, the law was added 
Okay, here, we're driving down the highway. What's the speed limit there? Uh, you don't know. It could be the Autobahn. There is no speed limit, but you come across a sign. Oh, speed limit 70. You look down and you're going 90. What are you doing? Breaking the law. You see, the law, the Ten Commandments, the 613 commandments from God, they were given so you would know when you're breaking the law. Now, you're driving down the road, you're breaking the law. What do you do immediately when you see the speed limit sign? You look down, you're going 90, you put on the brake. You slow down. What do you do next? You check your rearview mirror to see if the guy's following you with the lights going, right? Isn't that what you do? That's exactly right. Because you got guilt inside. You see what happens? When God posted his law, all right, the law is good. We're going to find that in a moment. It shows, oops, I am sinning. Sinning means I missed the mark. And how am I sinning? Because I'm a transgressor of the law. I broke the law. And so God gave the law so that you would know that you are a sinner and that you're breaking his law and you need a savior. You need somebody to rescue you. You need someone. In fact, he says it was temporary. The law was never intended to be per permanent. The law is temporary. It's inferior to the promise is what he's saying. The Ten Commandments, the, the law, is inferior to the promise because the promise is not temporary. But the law is temporary. It says until. Until. You know, I'm driving through that zone at 70 miles an hour and then all of a sudden uh, I see another sign because that 70 mile an hour was temporary. I come to a town and it says now the speed limit's 35. So I don't always keep going 70, do I? No, now I got to go 35. Or I get out on uh, another place where there's no signs that said the Autobahn, and I can go any speed I want. You see, it's, it, that sign was temporary. And what he's saying is the law, the Ten Commandments, the whole Torah, all of that, the 613, all these rules and regulations, they were all temporary until the seed, and that is Jesus. He's already told us. It's not seeds, plural, but it's the seed, Jesus. Until Jesus came to whom the promise referred. You know why we don't offer bloody sacrifices here? I don't ask you every Sunday, bring in your lamb because you've sinned all week and we need to slice its throat and spill its blood and then pour, burn it on the altar. You know why we Jesus came. It's all taken away. The temporary stuff is gone. It's gone. It's gone. He goes on, he says, the law was put into effect through angels. We know that from several places in the Bible that their angels were involved in that. Both in Acts and Hebrews, it tells us that the angels played a part. And then he says, not only was there angels involved, but there was a mediator. The mediator was Moses. The nation of Israel uh, said, Moses, you go up on the mountain, represent us to God, and get the law of God. Moses went up on the mountain, there was God, and there were the angels. And what he's saying here, look at, the law was put into effect with a mediator, a go-between, in-between. And he says, listen, a mediator, how, however, does not represent just one party. There's two parties involved. With the law, God gave his command, and, and the people... And there's ifs in it. You've got conditions to meet. If you're, going to, if you're going to live by this, you've got to keep every single commandment of God, all 613 perfectly, never ever fail at one at any time. Because if you do, you get all the curses of the covenant on you. Ooh. They agreed, God agreed, so we've got this two-party system going here, and God's saying, okay, if you're a lawbreaker, you're punished. Whew. Boy, the, the law, the law never could save you. All the law can do is make you guilty. All the law can do is make you look like a failure. All the law can do is condemn you. He says, but God is one. He made a promise by grace. This goes two ways. First of all, for Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant of promise was ratified in Genesis chapter 15. And in Genesis chapter 15, it tells us that it was a blood covenant. And by that, 
Abraham sacrificed an animal and he split the carcass in two pieces, put one on one side, one on the other side. And he took these animals and he split them in half and split them in half. And the way the, the blood covenant that worked is the two parties would walk between the pieces of the, of the sacrificed animals on the ground. And as they walked through it, they were swearing to one another, if I do not keep my end of the deal the covenant, the treaty. If I don't keep my, end, my, my part of it, then you are to kill me like these carcasses on the ground. Whew. So when you wanted to ratify a real treaty that, hey, you're not going to go back on this, you split the animals, you go through, because you're promising, whoa, if I don't keep my terms, I die. So that's the kind of covenant. Abraham put the pieces out on the ground, but when it came time to go through the pieces, it says a big flaming fire came through for God. But Abraham fell asleep. <laughs> He's sound asleep, man. God passes through the pieces. Covenant is over. It is what we call a one-sided, unilateral covenant. God made a promise to Abraham. Abraham promised nothing. Do you get that? He doesn't have to do anything. It is a grace covenant. God is going to provide everything. And that's why we have a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the seed to come is the one who is going to fulfill what Abraham could not fulfill. He would have to die. But Jesus died in his place because Abraham does not keep the terms of the covenant. None of us do. We're all sinners before God. It's all of grace. And so this is what he says. But God is one. This promise was made by God. And Jesus, who is God, is the one who is a recipient of the, the promise because he made it between Abraham and, and, and his seed, Jesus, saying, listen, this is not an inferior covenant. It's all of God. It's not got anything to do with you. Whoa. So why is grace superior to the law? Well, well, grace is superior to the law for the covenant's sake. Grace is superior to the law for the addition's sake. And he says, oh, hypothetically, for, for the hypothetical sake, it's, it's, it's superior to the law. He says, is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Oh, so does the law contradict the word of God, the promise that God made to Abraham? And the answer to that is, is it, is it sinful? And the answer is to, uh, to that is, absolutely not. In fact, in Romans 7, it says this, is the law sin? He says, certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. Hey, if the sign wasn't posted saying 70 miles an hour, I wouldn't know that I was speeding because it wasn't posted. If it was posted at 35 and I'm going 50, oh, I wouldn't have known because it wasn't posted. He said, but I, I would not have known I was a sinner for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. How would I know that that was wrong? I wouldn't have known unless God posted it. So there's nothing wrong with the law. He's saying, we know that the law is spiritual because every commandment of God is holy. It is just. It is pure. He says, but the problem is I am unspiritual. I'm sold as a slave to sin. You see, we're all born with a sinful nature. You never have to teach a child to do wrong. You probably had to teach your children to share because they really like that one sin called covet that he just talked about. I want what he wants. Why? Because we're born with a sinful nature. The Ten Commandments, nothing wrong with them. The 613, nothing wrong with them. They're all holy, pure, and good. They just can't save us. They can't save us. All they can do is show that we are sinners. He said, four, here's the hypothetical. If a law had been given that could impart life, righteousness certainly would have come by the law. But the fact is, it did not come by the law. And people tell me that when I ask them, how, how are you going to get into heaven? When you stand before God, God says, why should I let you in? What are you going to say? They say, well, I, I kept the Ten Commandments. Whoa! No, you did not. I know, all right, right, man, man, flag, 
red flags up everywhere. This person needs to know about the grace of God because that's going to keep you out of heaven because all you got to do is flaw in one point and you're guilty of all. Man, I, I said, no, I, I, the hypothetical sake, no. Why is grace superior to law? For the covenant's sake, for the addition's sake, for the hypothetical sake. Then he says, for the scriptural sake. But the scriptures declare that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. Oh, the whole world. In other places, all have sin, fall short of glory of God. We're all locked into the, the cell block of sin. He says, so that, I want to finish reading that, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. I'm going to come back to that statement. The next verse says, before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law. The idea we're held prisoners by the law, the law was like the warden. <laughs> Kept sure, made sure that we were in our cell block of sin and knew that we were the guilty prisoners. That's what the law does. It exposes your guilt. He says, we were locked up until faith. He says, we're locked up, locked up in our transgressions. We're locked up in our guilt. We're locked up in our shame and our sin. We're locked up being under the curse. That, that's the old life. Remember, we talked about the caterpillar life and then the new life. He said, we were all locked up in our sin. And, and the law was the warden that was keeping us locked up because it kept exposing the fact that I fall short. And he says, until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge. And the reason it was put in charge, oh, here it is, to lead us to Christ. Because the law can't save me, so where am I going to go if the law can't save me? It's going to point me to Jesus. And he says that we may be just, it's leading us to faith, that we may be justified by faith, that we may be justified by faith. I am made righteous by faith, not by keeping the law. The law exposes I'm a sinner, but faith is the way my sin is dealt with. Jesus deals with it. And by faith, I am declared righteous before God. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. We are not law keepers. Because I love Jesus, all right, I don't covet the way I used to covet. I live for Jesus. I don't covet my neighbor's wife. Don't do that because I love Jesus. Not, not because there's a law, but because that's just the natural thing you do when you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself. You fulfill the law without being a law keeper. You just do it. All by the grace of God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? We are no longer under the supervision of the law. And so that it says, but the scriptures declare the whole world is a prisoner of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to all who believe. All who believe. Here's why the grace is so superior to the law. The covenant's sake, the addition's sake, hypothetical sake, the scripture's sake, and for reality's sake. You are all sons of God, the text says. But it's through faith in Jesus. That's how I became a child of God. I believed in Jesus as my Savior. I was born again, and I became a child of God. And then it says, not only are you all sons, but you're all baptized. And this passage, the word baptism, isn't referring to water baptism. Because what the next verse says, you're neither bond nor free, slave, not a slave or a free person, male nor female. Nobody got a sex change when they got baptized in the water. But what he is saying here, you were all baptized into Christ by the Spirit. The moment you believed in Jesus, you were actually baptized into Christ. You went into the body of Christ, which is called the church. And you are part of a bigger body of believers. So he says, you have clothed, you put on Jesus Christ. You are now in Christ. And he is the promised seed that he made the promise to, to be the heir of everything. So because I am in him, I am one with him. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. There's no black or white. There's no Baptist or Presbyterian or Catholic. There's no Hispanic and Asian. Not in the body of Christ. We are all one in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, that's what we are in Christ. And he adds this. 
Hey, listen, if you belong to Christ, you believed in Jesus, you received him as your Savior, you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's heir. Why? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Jesus, believing in him, imputes to us his righteousness. We, we're an heir with Abraham. And he, says, he goes on, he says, we're heirs according to the promise. What is the promise? The promise is of salvation, that through Jesus, the whole world would be blessed, being made right with God. We are the heir of being made right, right, right with God. Let me sum all of this up. The law, that is rule-keeping, never could save you. Being a good person isn't good enough. Isn't good enough. Why the law then? Why all the rules? Well, to show you that you need a Savior. You need Jesus. You need Jesus Christ to save you from all your failures. He is the Savior of the world. You see, it is the grace of God that brings faith in Jesus alone that saves you. God grants you to faith when you open your heart to him and you believe he gives you a new life. You're a new, newborn creature in Christ. You're united with Jesus and all that belongs to Jesus now belongs to you. And you can receive that grace today. You just accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. We can do that right now while we pray. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for your word. We're very thankful, Lord, for the promises in it. The promise of the gift of eternal life, salvation, that is by grace alone through faith in Jesus. Lord, we pray that you'll bless us in a moment as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, realizing it's not about me, it's all about you. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.